There's a passage at the beginning of the Dhammapada that the mind is the forerunner of all things. Everything you experience, everything you do, is shaped first by the mind. Usually people read that and say, it's a nice idea. But they don't realize how deeply it goes into the Dhamma. When the Buddha explains the very complex causes for suffering, independent co-arising, one of the first things you notice is that sensory contact comes halfway through the lineup. Everything prior to that has to do with your mind, which means that when you see a sight, hear a sound, depending on how you've been training your mind, you either are or are not setting yourself up to suffer, no matter how good or bad that particular contact may be. This is why we meditate, is to train the mind. And the big difference, the Buddha said, is the ideas that we bring to the present moment. If we shape them in ignorance, they're going to lead to suffering. If we shape them with knowledge, they're going to be a path to the end of suffering. So as we meditate, we're trying to get to know the mind, so we can train it, so we can know what's going on, see where it's doing something unskillful, see where it's doing something skillful, abandon the unskillful habits, develop the skillful ones. So this is why we're focused on the breath, because the breath is right near the mind. I've heard sometimes people say, well, what are you going to do when you die? If you've been focusing on the breath all your life, the breath is not going to be there. Well, the reason we focus on the breath is not to get the breath itself, but because it is so close to the mind, so close to the processes that the Buddha calls fabrication. There's physical, verbal, and mental. Physical is the breath itself. Verbal is the way you talk to yourself, what the Buddha calls directed thought and evaluation. You focus on a topic and then you comment on it. And finally, there's mental fabrication, which is composed of feelings and perceptions. Feelings, of course, are feelings of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. Perceptions are the images, labels that you apply to things. Basically your lizard brain, which has images that come up that will then get your breathing in a certain way, which will create a certain feeling. Like if it's a threatening image, you're going to breathe in a way that's fearful, and that gives rise to feelings of disease. And then you start thinking about it. If you do this in ignorance, you tend to just fall into your old patterns. But if you're with the breath, you start seeing these processes. You actually learn how to shape them in a skillful way. Right now we're shaping them for the sake of concentration, breathing in a way that's soothing, calming, or energizing if the body needs energy, but breathing in a way that brings the body into balance. And then talking to yourself about the breath. Is the breath good? If it's not good, what can you do to make it better? If it is good, what can you do to maintain it? And how do you watch for a way of breathing that felt good for a while, but then all of a sudden isn't quite right for the body anymore? And how do you make these changes? You don't want to squeeze things. You simply bring to mind the fact that you could breathe a little bit longer, you could breathe a little bit shorter. It is possible to change the way you breathe. So you learn how to talk to yourself about the breath and the mind's relationship to the breath. You're trying to create a feeling of well-being, a feeling of ease, fullness. And you hold in mind a perception of the breath that allows that sense of ease to spread through the body. So the breath isn't just confined to the nose and the lungs, and the ease isn't confined to the nose and the lungs. It can spread out. So you're getting practical, hands-on experience with how to fabricate with knowledge. 
get the mind to settle down. But you don't want to leave this understanding about the process of fabrication on the meditation seat when you get up. You want to realize that the extent to which, even when you're dealing with other people, the important thing is not so much what they're doing, it's how you're approaching the situation, how you're already fabricating it, and how you might do with a little bit more knowledge. If someone does something that would normally set you off, you can remind yourself, I don't have to breathe in a way that makes me suffer. I don't have to think in a way that makes me suffer. I don't have to hold on to perceptions in the mind that are going to make the situation worse. Because the whole point about fabrication is that you have choices. This is one of the reasons why we not only meditate, but also learn about what the Buddha had to say, because he gives lots of different ways of perceiving situations. A set of values and a sense of what is good for us in the long term and how long long term can be. So you don't get stuck in our old ways of perceiving that lead to suffering. So in one way the Buddha is saying that you are suffering because of what you're doing, but he's, he's not saying all the blame lies with you. It's not a blame game anyhow. There are people out there doing horrible things. But what he's saying is that you have the opportunity not to have to suffer from the horrible things in the world. If the end of suffering required that everything in the world be perfect, it would never happen. We have to learn how to not suffer in the midst of a lot of noise, a lot of activity, a lot of unskillful intentions aimed at us. One of the things the Buddha has you remind yourself with is when someone says something really harmful or ill-intended, that this is just the nature of human speech. People have mouths, and they can use them in any way they want. Don't be surprised. You're on the human level if you wanted a place where everybody just says really nice things. Either you have to go to some of the Deva levels, or you have to go to Mercury and uh, Kurt Vonnegut's novel, where the harmoniums say simply, here I am, here I am, here I am, so glad you are, so glad you are. That's not the human world. And so when people are being unkind, it's not all that unusual. Think of the Buddha himself. All the false accusations that were made against him. Been working on this life of the Buddha. I've been struck by how many really difficult situations the Buddha had to deal with. We tend to think of the Buddha as after his awakening, he's kind of floating through the world three inches off the ground with a pool of light instead of a shadow, and everybody bowing down to him in the same way that grass would bow down to a wind. But that's not the case. There are people who had their hearts set against him. Made all kinds of false accusations, different attacks. But he's able to fend them off and not get knocked over by them. So if even the Buddha get, was going to be subject to unfair treatment, okay, what about us? It's only normal. That's one way of dealing with situations like that. The other way, of course, is, as the Buddha said, simply tell yourself, if someone says something really nasty, an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear, and leave it at that. Think of yourself as an elephant going into battle, he says. People are going to shout all kinds of things, all kinds of insults at the poor elephant, and yet it has to do its job. There'll be horrible things to see, horrible things to hear, horrible things to smell, to touch. And the elephant still says, OK, I've got, I just can't let myself get bowled over by these things. So as we go into human society, it's not the case that we have to. Ex we can't expect that everybody's going to be nice. If you have that kind of expectation, you're setting yourself up to suffer. 
think of it more as going into battle. You want to make sure that your actions are skillful. As I was saying this morning, you don't want your goodness to have to depend on the goodness of other people. And you don't want their misbehavior to become an excuse for your misbehavior. Because your misbehavior then just becomes your bad karma, regardless of what other people did. That's part of the long term that the Buddha has you think about. That when all is said and done, the story of your life is not so much what other people did to you, and the story of your life is what you did. And that's what you carry with you. So you want to make sure that you realize you're not going to go to hell because of what other people do. You go to hell because of what you do. You go to heaven because of what you do. You gain nirvana because of what you do. And so you want to make your goodness independent. Something that doesn't have to rely on everybody else's goodness. Because all of us born in this human world have good karma and bad karma in our past. If we had nothing but good karma, we wouldn't be here. We'd be in a much better place. And so it's only to be expected that the, some of that bad karma is going to come back at us. It's a natural part of the human world. And John Fuang had a student, a young nurse who was very good looking, and her fellow nurses seemed to be jealous of her, and they liked to gossip about her. And over time, it was beginning to get to her. One day she went to sit and meditate with him, and she had this vision of herself in a house of mirrors. She saw herself being reflected back, 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 many, many times. And she thought about how she probably was gossiped about in those past lifetimes as well. The whole idea of all that gossip got to be oppressive. So after she came out of meditation, she went to talk to him about it, hoping that he would give her some words of comfort. But instead, he gave her a cold water bath. He said, well, you are the one who wanted to be born here anyhow. What did you expect? And that brought her to her senses, that this is the kind of place we're in. But we don't have to be those kinds of people. We can make ourselves better. We can develop a goodness inside that is independent. This is another reason why we meditate. That sense of well-being that comes from settling in. It's not just for the sake of having a nice place to stay. It's meant to give you strength, realizing that you don't have to depend on the words of other people for your own well-being. You don't have to depend on their actions. You have to ask yourself, do you want to feed off of other people's words? And John Lee says people spit out their words. If we feed off their words, it's like feeding off of some food that they've spit out. And then when our stomach hurts, who are you going to blame? So the meditation offers you something better inside to feed on, a sense of well-being, a sense of spaciousness inside, a sense that you've got your own territory here. You don't have to let other people invade this territory inside, and that includes your mind. No matter how much they may want to invade, it's up to you as to whether you're going to pull their words in, pull their actions in, and make them an issue. So a useful perception is that their words just go right past you, and you have the choice of whether to suck them in or not. And if they're not good, just let them pass. And you keep your eye focused on what you're doing. the appropriateness or inappropriateness of your actions, your words, your thoughts. And when you take care of that, then if other people are not taking care of their actions, well, that's their business. But you've got your responsibilities covered.
you've got a goodness inside that you can depend on because it is independent. <coughs> It depends on the skills you develop as you shape your mind, train the mind to treat itself well, and then take that mind into the world. And that's, that will be the mind that shapes your experience. And whether other people change or not, that's going to be up to them. But the way you shape your experience wouldn't be causing yourself any suffering. That's a gift to yourself and it's a gift to other people. So try to get more and more sensitive to how you're shaping things. The more knowledge you can bring to that, the less you're going to suffer. The less you suffer, the more strength you'll have to keep on maintaining that goodness. Because that's a real treasure. We talk about the Buddha and Dhamma Sangha as being a treasure or a gem. In the old days, they believed that gems had a protective power. Well, if you develop the Buddha's qualities, the Dharma's qualities, the Sangha's qualities, they have a protective power. They protect you from doing things you're later going to regret. And from doing things that are going to cause you to suffer right here and now. So as you carry this awareness of your own mind into the world, that's what got you covered. <coughs> 